Lesson 2 Moses' History Lesson Sabbath Afternoon October 2 The Lord directed Moses to recount to the children of Israel his dealings with them in their deliverance from Egypt and their wonderful preservation in the wilderness. He was to call to mind their unbelief and murmuring when brought into trial and the Lord's great mercy and loving kindness which had never forsaken them. This would stimulate their faith and strengthen their courage. While they would be led to realize their own sin and weakness, they would realize also that God was their righteousness and strength. It is just as essential that the people of God in this day should bear in mind how and when they have been tested and where their faith has failed where they have imperiled his cause by their unbelief and also by their self-confidence. God's mercy, his sustaining providence, his never-to-be-forgotten deliverances are to be recounted step by step. As God's people thus review the past, they should see that the Lord is ever repeating his dealings. They should understand the warnings given and should beware not to repeat their mistakes. Renouncing all self-dependence, they are to trust in Him to save them from again dishonoring His name. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 210 The book of Deuteronomy should be carefully studied by those living on the earth today. It contains a record of the instruction given to Moses to give to the children of Israel. In it, the law is repeated. The law of God was often to be repeated to Israel. That its precepts might not be forgotten, it was to be kept before the people and was ever to be exalted and honored. Parents were to read the law to their children, teaching it to them line upon line, precept upon precept. And on public occasions, the law was to be read in the hearing of all the people. Upon obedience to this law depended the prosperity of Israel. If they were obedient, it would bring them life. If disobedient, death. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1117. Satan is ever at work endeavoring to pervert what God has spoken, to blind the mind and darken the understanding, and thus lead men into sin. This is why the Lord is so explicit, making his requirements so very plain that none need err. God is constantly seeking to draw men close under his protection that Satan may not practice his cruel deceptive power upon them. He has condescended to speak to them with his own voice, to write with his own hand the living oracles, and these blessed words, all instinct with life and luminous with truth, are committed to men as a perfect guide. Because Satan is so ready to catch away the mind and divert the affections from the Lord's promises and requirements, the greater diligence is needed to fix them in the mind and impress them upon the heart. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 503 and 504 Sunday, October 3 The Ministry of Moses the Lord through Moses delivered the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Moses was a mediator for his people, often standing between them and the wrath of God. When the anger of the Lord was greatly kindled against Israel for their unbelief, their murmurings, and their grievous sins, Moses' love for them was tested. God proposed to destroy them and to make of him a mighty nation. Moses showed his love for Israel by his earnest pleading in their behalf. In his distress, he prayed God to turn from his fierce anger and forgive Israel or blot his name out of his book. Early Writings, page 162 The life of Christ was one of unselfish service, and his life is our lesson book. The work that he began we are to carry forward. With his life of toil and sacrifice before them, can those who profess his name hesitate to deny self, to lift the cross and follow him? He humbled himself to the lowest depths that we might be lifted to the heights of purity and holiness and completeness. He became poor that he might pour into our poverty-stricken souls the fullness of his riches. 
he endured the cross of shame that he might give us peace and rest and joy and make us partakers of the glories of his throne. Should we not give back to God all that he has redeemed, the affections he has purified, and the body that he has purchased to be kept unto sanctification and holiness? True Christianity diffuses love through the whole being. It touches every vital part, the brain, the heart, the helping hands, the feet, enabling men to stand firmly where God requires them to stand. We can, we can reveal the likeness of our divine Lord. We can know the science of spiritual life. We can glorify God in our bodies and in our spirits, which are His. In Heavenly Places, page 43. Pure love is simple in its operations and is distinct from any other principle of action. Love should be cherished and cultivated, for its influence is divine. In Jesus you may love with fervor, with earnestness. This love may increase in depth and expand without limit. Love to God will ensure love to your neighbor, and you will engage in the duties of life with a deep, unselfish interest. Pure principles should underlie your actions. Inward peace will bring even your thoughts into a healthful channel. The serenity of mind which you may possess will bless all with whom you associate. This peace and calmness will, in time, become natural and will reflect its precious rays upon all around you to be again reflected upon you. The more you taste this heavenly peace and quietude of mind, the more it will increase. It is an animated living pleasure which does not throw all the moral energies into a stupor, but awakens them to increased activity. Perfect peace is an attitude of heaven which angels possess. Lift Him Up, page 94 Monday, October 4 Fulfilled Prophecy God cannot display the knowledge of His will and the wonders of His grace among the unbelieving world unless He has witnesses scattered all over the earth. It is His plan that those who are partakers of this great salvation through Jesus Christ should be His missionaries, bodies of light throughout the world, to be as signs to the people, living epistles known and read of all men, their faith and works testifying to the near approach of the coming Savior and showing that they have not received the grace of God in vain. The people must be warned to prepare for the coming judgment. To those who have been listening only to fables, God will give an opportunity to hear the sure word of prophecy, whereunto they do well that they take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. He will present the sure word of truth to the understanding of all who will take heed. All may contrast truth with the fables presented to them by men who claim to understand the word of God and to be qualified to instruct those in darkness. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 631. When the Christian is looking forward to duties and severe trials that he anticipates are to be brought upon him because of his Christian profession of faith, it is human nature to contemplate the consequences and shrink from the prospects, and this will be decidedly so as we near the close of this earth's history. We may be encouraged by the truthfulness of God's word that Christ never failed his children as their safe leader in the hour of their trial for we have the truthful record of those who have been under the oppressive powers of Satan that his grace is according to their day. God is faithful who will not suffer us to be tempted above that we are able. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 398 More than 1,800 years have passed since the Savior gave the promise of his coming. Throughout the centuries, his words have filled with courage the hearts of his faithful ones. The promise has not yet been fulfilled, but nonetheless, sure is the word that has been spoken. Christ will come in his own glory, in the glory of his Father, and in the glory of the holy angels. Ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands of angels, the beautiful triumphant sons of God, possessing surpassing loveliness and glory, will escort him on his way. In the place of a crown of thorns, he will wear a crown of glory, 
a crown within a crown. In the place of that old purple robe, he will be clothed in a garment of whitest white, so as no fuller on earth can white it. And on his vesture and on his thigh a name will be written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Our High Calling, page 367. Tuesday, October 5. A thousand times more numerous. The government of Israel was characterized by the most thorough organization, wonderful alike for its completeness and its simplicity. The order so strikingly displayed in the perfection and arrangement of all God's created works was manifest in the Hebrew economy. God was the center of authority and government, the sovereign of Israel. Moses stood as their visible leader by God's appointment to administer the laws in his name. From the elders of the tribes, a council of seventy was afterward chosen to assist Moses in the general affairs of the nation. Next came the priests who consulted the Lord in the sanctuary. Chiefs or princes ruled over the tribes. Under these were captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties, and captains over tens. And lastly, officers who might be employed for special duties. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 15. The Hebrew camp was arranged in exact order. It was separated into three great divisions, each having its appointed position in the encampment. In the center was the tabernacle, the abiding place of the invisible king. Around it were stationed the priests and Levites. Beyond these were encamped all the other tribes. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 374. The same principles of piety and justice that were to guide the rulers among God's people in the time of Moses and of David were also to be followed by those given the oversight of the newly organized Church of God in the Gospel Dispensation. The order that was maintained in the early Christian Church made it possible for them to move forward solidly as a well-disciplined army clad with the armor of God. The companies of believers, though scattered over a large territory, were all members of one body, all moved in concert and in harmony with one another. When dissension arose in a local church, as later it did arise in Antioch and elsewhere, and the believers were unable to come to an agreement among themselves, such matters were not permitted to create a division in the church, but were referred to a general council of the entire body of believers made up of appointed delegates from the various local churches with the apostles and elders in positions of leading responsibility. Thus the efforts of Satan to attack the church in isolated places were met by concerted action on the part of all, and the plans of the enemy to disrupt and destroy were thwarted. The Acts of the Apostles, page 95 God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 he requires that order and system be observed in the conduct of church affairs today no less than in the days of old. He desires his work to be carried forward with thoroughness and exactness so that he may place upon it the seal of his approval. Christian is to be united with Christian, church with church, the human instrumentality cooperating with the divine, every agency subordinate to the Holy Spirit, and all combined in giving to the world the good tidings of the grace of God. The Acts of the Apostles, page 96. Wednesday, October 6. Kadesh Barnea. After the spies had spoken of the fertility of the land, all but two spoke very discouragingly of their ability to possess it. They said that the people were very strong that dwelt in the land, and the cities were surrounded with great and high walls, and more than all this, they saw the children of the giant Anak there. They then described how the people were situated around Canaan and expressed the fear that it would be impossible for them ever to possess this land. As the people listened to this report, they gave vent to their disappointment in bitter reproaches and wailing. 
They did not wait to reflect and reason that God, who had brought them out thus far, would certainly give them the land. They left God out of the question. They acted as though in taking the city of Jericho, the key to the land of Canaan, they must depend solely on the power of arms. God had declared that he would give them the country, and they should have fully trusted him to fulfill his word. But their unsubdued hearts were not in harmony with his plans. They did not reflect how wonderfully he had wrought in their behalf, bringing them out of their Egyptian bondage, cutting a path for them through the waters of the sea, and destroying the pursuing host of Pharaoh. In their unbelief, they were limiting the work of God and distrusting the hand that had hitherto safely guided them. In this instance, they repeated their former error of murmuring against Moses and Aaron. This, then, is the end of all our high hopes, said they. This is the land we have traveled all the way from Egypt to possess. They blamed their leaders for bringing trouble upon Israel and again charged them with deceiving the people and leading them astray. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 148 God did not design that His people, Israel, should wander forty years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 19. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he could not fulfill his covenant with them. For forty years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 68 and 69. The purpose which God seeks to accomplish through His people today is the same that He desired to accomplish through Israel when He brought them forth out of Egypt. By beholding the goodness, the mercy, the justice, and the love of God revealed in the church, the world is to have a representation of His character. Not to this world only, but to the universe are we to make manifest the principles of His kingdom. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, pages 12 and 13. Thursday, October 7. The Iniquity of the Amorite God told the Israelites that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full and their expulsion and extermination could not be justified until they had filled up the cup of their iniquity. Idolatry and sin marked their course, but the measure of their guilt was not such that they could be devoted to destruction. In His love and pity, God would let light shine upon them in more distinct rays. He would give them opportunity to behold the working of His wondrous power, that there might be no excuse for their course of evil. It is thus that God deals with the nations. Through a certain period of probation, He exercises long-suffering toward nations, cities, and individuals. But when it is evident that they will not come unto Him that they might have life, judgments are visited upon them. The time came when judgment was inflicted upon the Amorites, and the time will come when all the transgressors of His law will know that God will by no means clear the guilty. The Review and Herald, May 2, 1893 The Lord is regarded as cruel by many in requiring His people to make war with other nations. They say that it is contrary to His benevolent character. But He who made the world and formed man to dwell upon the earth has unlimited control over all the works of His hands, and it is His right to do as He pleases and what He pleases with the work of His hands. Man has no right to say to his Maker, Why doest thou thus? There is no injustice in his character. He is the ruler of the world, and a large portion of his subjects have rebelled against his authority and have trampled upon his law. 
He has used his people as instruments of his wrath to punish wicked nations who have vexed them and seduced them into idolatry. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1117. Every follower of Christ will find opportunity to show Christian kindness and love, and in so doing, he will prove that he is a possessor of the religion of Jesus Christ. This religion teaches us to exercise patience and long-suffering when brought into places where we receive treatment that is harsh and unjust. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that we should inherit a blessing. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 When Christ was reviled, he reviled not again. His religion brings with it a meek and quiet spirit. There is constant need of patience, gentleness, self-denial, and self-sacrifice in the exercise of Bible religion. But if the Word of God is made an abiding principle in our lives, everything with which we have to do, each word, each trivial act, will reveal that we are subject to Jesus Christ. If the Word of God is received into the heart, it will empty the soul of self-sufficiency and self-dependence. Our lives will be a power for good because the Holy Spirit will fill our minds with the things of God. God's Amazing Grace, page 248. For further reading, That I May Know Him, Christ's Blessings Universal, page 98, and Our High Calling, The Highest Exercise of Our Powers, page 61.